Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. Today, our guest is Professor Emeritus Raymond Silverman. How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you uh, recently, and there were so many places in which our lives intertwined. Uh, it's funny, over different decades, right? Not necessarily at the right at the right time, but in different times and uh, places. So I'd be curious to ask you about your time growing up in my hometown of Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, like you, I'm a, a native son of uh, Los Angeles and Angelino, as they say. And um, I grew up in the uh, 1950s and 60s in, in Los Angeles and uh, very much enjoyed it. Uh, I think what struck me most about it and that I appreciate it to, of course, a limited extent as a as a young man or uh, as a child and then a young man um, was its diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I grew up in a part of uh, greater Los Angeles over on the east side, in the community of Monterey Park, which was probably half to 60 percent uh, Asian. Mm -hmm. So uh, first generation Chinese, second generation Japanese American, uh, and then a mix of people of European descent. And the school I went to is very, very diverse. Uh, and so I grew up um, uh, as a member of a minority, actually. Uh, there, there were more kids of Asian descent in the, the school I went to, an elementary school I went to. Uh, the, of European descent, and and so that undoubtedly sort of instilled in me a certain outlook towards uh, people who don't look like me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't think about it actually, and that's why I love the spontaneity uh, of the podcast and the conversation. Until you said this, and I don't know if I showed you when we were together, but you know, as you know, I'm no longer in Los Angeles, but I've maintained my Los Angeles Public Library card, and mm. there was a special edition of that card that people could look up online that represents the kind of East LA and Monterey Park uh, general area. And there is an artist um, from there. I'm blanking on the name now. I'll have mm. to come back and uh, yeah. credit him and attribute him better later. But the artist uh, is of Asian descent. And because mm. of the kind of mixed uh, Latino heritage that's in that area of East LA as well, he created this sort of, uh, it looks like it could be an icon of St. Michael uh, or of uh, St. George, more like St. Michael, like slaying this this devil demon dragon type figure but it's in the style of japanese artwork during the kind of uh samurai period and then the clothing of the samurai is like la dodgers and like kind of hispanic streetwear yeah 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 there are a number of uh artists in los angeles as well as other you know cities in the us who've kind of riffed on that and the mix mixing of uh a lot of different uh, heritage traditions uh, that occur, and uh, yeah, that uh, I don't know if you en encountered much of this in LA, but uh, there's a very strong mural tradition of painting mm -hmm. the exteriors of, of buildings that goes <clears throat> way back many decades. Yeah, I don't know if I think it's called the Great Wall of Los Angeles. I could be mm. mistaken on it, but mm. you know, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, about uh, you know maybe twenty miles, maybe thirty miles northwest of where you grew up, mm. and there they have the so-called L.A. River, which is dry most of the year, and a lot right. of films are shot there. And there were a lot of murals in in that area. I recall. Yeah, yeah. So, it, which I think. Again, it's not only Los Angeles, but many cities have embraced the fact that no matter what the city might do, they're going to be people who want to express themselves <laughs> through through graffiti. Yeah. And so why not why not embrace it and actually invite people, sort of commission people to mm -hmm. express you know what's in, what's important to them? So uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty. Uh, Pretty great thing. Yeah, I know. I know Banksy is famous for that in the United Kingdom. Um, but I once visited about a decade ago the University of California in San Diego, in La Jolla, California, just north mm -hmm. San Diego, and they had what you're talking about. They they kind of leaned into it and embraced it by creating a designated graffiti zone, and so yeah. it was all the kind <clears throat> of illicit 
street culture of graffiti, but it was in a designated location. And then they were kind of more liberal and lax because it's a designated area in terms of like, they weren't trying to content manage. It was kind of free speech, especially since the public institution. But then I think they were harsher on the people that would go outside the designated area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so okay. funny. That's so cool. Yeah. And and so growing up around that, let me ask you the kind of like the most basic, simple question, having seen it and, and grown up in it. And I don't know if, if you were educated in, in a system that provided art classes, but like, how do you define art? You know, it's in the title of my podcast, The Philosophy of Art and Science, uh, partly because philosophy of art was my favorite class in undergrad and I didn't want to neglect the sciences, but um, like, how do you, how do you define art? And is that definition evolved in, in your kind of experience over time with it? Uh, yeah, so that, that is, you know, one of the great questions of, you know, humanities, of the humanities uh, that we're uh, constantly returning to, constantly thinking about, you know, uh, there are periods of time where people just throw up their hands and say, you know, enough already, you know, you know, we're, sp we're spending too much time thinking about trying to define what art is. Uh, and, you know, some people say that it's, it might be easier to define what art isn't as opposed to what it is. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I, I've thought an awful lot about it, especially uh, with regards to thinking about it cross-culturally and whether or not this is a concept that is uh, distinctive to, you know, the global north, the west, or if it's something that's universal or not. I've come to believe that, you know, all societies uh, throughout time have produced what we might refer to as art, despite the fact that in a lot of societies, you know, throughout time, there might not have been kind of an explicit term for it. Um, but the idea of people expressing themselves creatively um, is, for, at least for me, what is at the heart of art. Um, and there's also been a lot of uh, debate that gone on for many, many, many years about uh, differentiating art from craft. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people that create, you know, usually people associate art with, with beauty and yes. making beautiful things and, uh, you know, the, the uh, field of aesthetics and thinking about that. Um, but, uh, you know, in that context, it's, it's often juxtaposed or contrasted with craft. Uh, there are people that make beautiful things but are not, uh, not regarded as artists. And once again, I've thought a lot about that. And there are many, many, many people who do create beautiful things, things that are not only beautiful, but things that are extremely important and useful for the communities in which they work, in which they live. Um, uh, but, but what they produce is something that they reproduce over and over and over again, you know, making, the same kind of object in the same way, um, you know, over a, a long period of time. What for me differentiates a craftsman from an artist is that the artist is also uh, constantly thinking about what it is she or he is making. Mm -hmm. And this is where the creativity enters into the mix. Yeah. It's somebody who isn't going to do something the same way over and over and over again. but constantly thinking about, well, you know, how can I improve what it is I'm doing? How can I ex perhaps express something a little bit differently in what it is that I do? Um, and for me, that is what differentiates a uh, craftsman from an artist. And in turn, you know, we're going to eventually get to talking about Ethiopian painting. Yeah. Uh, but there, there are <clears throat> Ethiopian painters who are craftsmen, very fine craftsmen, who basically have learned to produce work uh, in a certain idiom in a certain way. Uh, and what they do uh, is greatly admired. It serves uh, function you know, successfully. Uh, but when they're commissioned <clears throat> to do something, they're doing it the same way over and over. Mm -hmm. But then there are painters who don't operate like that as well. And an excellent example of that is uh, a painter who 
was uh, raised uh, in a family where his father was uh, an Orthodox priest. He became an ordained priest, but in the process of doing that as a young man, he worked with uh, a few uh, painters in the church uh, that he attended. Uh, this was in Bichena in, in Gojang. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, uh, it really hit a chord with him and he developed a real passion for it. So much so um, that he eventually moved to Addis Ababa and actually left the priesthood wow. uh, as a practicing priest. He still is you know, deeply spiritual and involved in the church. Um, but anyway, this man, uh, Kesadamu Tesfau, um, mm -hmm. is somebody who I came to regard as sort of a quintessential artist. This man was amazing. He, he once told me that you know, when he falls asleep at night, he dreams hmm. about about making things, not only paintings, but other things as well. And uh, as a really wonderful example of that, Kesadamu has produced uh, hundreds of paintings of St. George slaying the dragon. And no two are alike. Wow. He feels compelled to do something different, uh, to think differently about what he's, he's depicting. The iconography, the symbolism is all there to make it work as a representation of St. George and the dragon, but the way it looks uh, can be quite different. And I just marveled at that. And he's a good example of someone who I believe is, is truly an artist as opposed to a craftsman. So Yeah, that's a really, good distinction and it takes me back like i said actually the alternative to the philosophy of art it was called philosophy of aesthetics so you you mentioned mm -hmm. aesthetics and beauty we would argue about things like beauty and especially things in modern and postmodern art whether ready mades or art and we'd have endless arguments the one thing i appreciated about that class was it was it was within philosophy it was like a 500 level course but it was the most diverse because there were craftsmen there, as you speak of, there were um, political science students, mm -hmm. um, there were painters, there were carvers, there were people in creative writing, and there were people in the natural sciences that were in there as well. So a bunch of people brought different perspectives. You also kind of mentioned this intentionality, we used to call it like authorial intent and what role that has in art as well. We would even discuss morality as, as one um, factor, which kind of comes to mind, especially in the context of Ethiopia, and especially the figure of St. George is, or Georgis is, is interesting because he's popular in Ethiopia. I think he's the patron saint of England, and then mm -hmm. he's super mm -hmm. popular in the Middle East as well. So he's a, a pretty universal saint that I think others could, could recognize, um, even if there are different spices added to that particular cauldron in, in yeah. each artwork. Right. Yeah, something I might add, a lot of people um, kind of automatically is, um, have expectations that art is supposed to be beautiful, mm -hmm. and that aesthetics is uh, associated with beauty. But what, at least for me, I've come to learn, and, and there's plenty of evidence of this, is that often art you know, art doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be beautiful. There's a lot of ugly art, things that are made intentionally, mm -hmm. not to be beautiful. It's, it's sort of the, the uh, antithesis of, of beauty, uh, but that qualifies as, as art, as a mode of, of expression. Are you thinking um, of like the androgyny of Mona Lisa or? Yeah, yeah, um, but there, you know, there, there are lots of images that, uh, conjure up, you know, negative ideas uh, that are not mm -hmm. seen as, as beautiful, like yeah. depictions of the, like depictions of the devil mm -hmm. that you find in societies yeah. all over the world. Uh, and that he, right. you know, he's usually not presented as a beautiful, you know, being. Yeah. Uh, that's something quite c contrary to that. So, yeah. So anyway, you know, back, back to what I started with is that, you know, I think it is important, uh, interesting, uh, one might argue even fun, to ruminate about what is art. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's something that is uh, kind of ungraspable. 
Yes. It's, it's one of those things that I think it's important to grapple with trying to define it, you know, occasionally or think about what, you know, what in fact it is. And uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, relating to this, uh, I mentioned in passing that there are many uh, societies, cultures in the world that don't have an explicit term for art. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with what the, what the, the term for art would be in Amarinya? Um, I've heard people say Ubab, uh -huh. Ubabat, and mm -hmm. Kinet Ubab as well in different contexts. And it's, mm -hmm. it's funny to me, it's actually a cognate with the Arabic word for mm -hmm. uh, wisdom. And in fact, both in colloquial Arabic um, and to some extent, if you think about it in Ethiopia, the Aviv is the wise man, and it's it's a it's a medical doctor even. Mm -hmm. So it has such wi wide ranging capacity in Semitic tongues to be art, science, and medical doctor. <laughs> so I think it's a kind of a weird word, and to me, it's never kind of been a clear word. I think a lot of people, uh, modern Amharic speakers, frankly. Um, are not speaking Amharic fully. They're 30 to 40% of what they speak, at least in Addis Ababa, I could speak. Maybe in, you know, Bichanna, Gwajam and other places, it's it's more pure. But the Addis Ababa I'm exposed to in the diaspora and in Addis Ababa is about 30 to 40% English. And so they would probably just use the English word art mm. with an accent. Um, but those who know a little bit better, I think would use the word Tibab or some yeah. variant. Is that is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, yeah, that that's, you know, I've asked a lot of people that question and mm -hmm. uh, have, have gotten pretty much the same same response. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So people with technical law, uh, knowledge who are kind of sophisticated about these matters and have looked into it and thought critically would use the word tibab, which again mm -hmm. just means wisdom or Sophia. Right. Um, and uh, but but yeah, I, th I think a lot of like my peers would just say art, you know, and roll the mm -hmm. R. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. Um, and, and so on that uh, topic of Ethiopia, whether it was when you were in Los Angeles or other parts that you had moved, I'm wondering, so when I grew up in the 90s and in the environment I grew up, we had um, the kind of, um, I think it was you 2 and so many other artists who gathered in the 80s, famine, 90s, people still kind of thinking about stuff like that. And um, the image was begging for money. Um, there was even a famous, you know, comedy cartoon, South Park, that famously kind of ruined my childhood with the idea oh, yeah, of starving Marvin, I right? And, and yeah, that, that's, that's awful. awful. That's the image people had of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering, as we speak of uh, these images, of the mental image you had first of Ethiopia, I'm wondering like what context, I know later at the university level, you kind of got a greater spark for it in, in your field. But I'm wondering what was your kind of prior knowledge about Ethiopia before entering into it? Like, what did you know about Ethiopia? Yeah, sadly, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you here. I, I knew virtually nothing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew who Haile Selassie was. I knew a little bit about, you know, where he came from, about, uh, you know the Italian invasion of uh, Ethiopia and the fact that Ethiopia was perceived as really the only nation or state in uh, on the continent that was was not formally colonized, uh, and that was about it, except for that negative imagery that you just mm -hmm. spoke about. Um, you know, of, of uh, war, uh, famine. Uh, uh, well, drought and famine, and uh, uh, you know, so kind of this this pathetic image, um, and uh, and so that that's what I knew before I went to Ethiopia the first time, mm -hmm. um, and that image uh, was completely displaced in a split second after I walked off the plane. Yeah, that that's wonderful. And before you even got on the plane, could you tell the story of how you started kind of studying West Africa, but was 
uh, you know, according to people's desires, they could say serendipitously, coincidentally, or uh, providentially kind of <laughs> towards East Africa. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know, I, uh, like your dad, I went to UCLA as an undergraduate mm -hmm. and was introduced to African art there. And uh, my mentor there worked in West Africa. Um, interestingly, um, the way the West has approached the continent of Africa, it has sort of divided it up into these zones of mm. what has been referred to as Sub-Saharan Black Africa, uh, Northern Arab Africa, which is, you know, they, it ends up getting kind of racial, racialized, that's sort of a white Africa. And interestingly, Ethiopia was set off by itself. And there is a whole um, subfield of uh, academic study, uh, Ethiopian studies, of in, which was quite insular. Um, it often attracted, you know, sometimes people who were, you know, studying early Christian and Byzantine uh, civilizations, sometimes near Middle Eastern civilizations, rarely but occasionally. Uh, people who had been, you know, st studying uh, Africa south of the Sahara, um, but it, it, it kind of existed by itself. Um, and in my studies as a budding uh, Africanist uh, art historian, um, Ethiopia was not part of the curriculum. We learned nothing about Ethiopia. It wasn't African wow. art. Yeah, exactly. But then again, you know, I studied other kinds of art as well. You know, I, I, I studied, uh, you know, Islamic art, what was mm -hmm. referred to as Islamic art. Uh, Ethiopia wasn't dealt with in that context. I studied early Christian and Byzantine art. Ethiopia wasn't part of that story either. Um, and so it sort of kind of falls through the cracks, except for this very specialized and small group of individuals who, uh, you know, define themselves as Ethiopianists. And, uh, you know, something that you might or might not want to talk about in mm -hmm. this context today is um, I, I found it really interesting the way uh, Habasha Ethiopians perceive themselves mm -hmm. as, you know, if, if they were to look at themselves in a broader context of belonging to, you know, some, some larger group whether they see themselves as being more Middle Eastern, North African. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, just kind of uh, grappling with that was, you know, sort of part of the equation. Um, and so, uh, so when I started my uh, career, you know, when I was working on my uh, PhD and dissertation, I went off to West Africa to, to work on a project there, came back and was very much a West Africanist. And then the first uh, position I held, academic position I held uh, at Michigan State University, um, within six months of arriving there as a junior faculty member, I had uh, an eminent historian of Ethiopia who was on the faculty, a guy by the name of Harold Marcus, mm -hmm. walk into my office. Amazing. And, and say, uh, you know, they said, you know, Ray, it's, you know, wonderful to have you here, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I have some good news for you. I just returned from Addis Ababa, um, and we were, we as in Michigan State University, were awarded uh, the honor of hosting uh, the next International Conference of Ethiopian Studies here in 1994. And he, you know, came into my office, it must have been 1989, uh, and he said, uh, I would like you to organize an exhibition of Ethiopian art, for <laughs> the, which which will be shown at the same time as the conference here. And I looked at him and I said, I don't know anything about Ethiopia. I, you know, yeah. I work in West Africa. I, I can't possibly do that. And he he just smiled and looked at me. And he said, You know, you're, you're a smart young man, and you have five years. Yep. There, so anyway. There's uh, one of my favorite martial arts coach. He's a jujitsu and MMA guy, John Danaher, and actually mm -hmm. did his uh, PhD at Columbia in philosophy mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, quit the professorial life to become a martial arts coach. Yeah. He says in five years, you'd be surprised what you can do. 
like you can oh, get yeah. a lot accomplished and it seems like yeah. you did <laughs> yeah yeah so um anyway to make a long story short i um decided to, to go ahead and uh, pursue working on this exhibition project thinking that it was going to be a uh you know a little five five year detour mm -hmm. from my work in west africa yeah. and, and <laughs> anyway and and then i uh you know, 1991, August 1991, I think it was my yeah. first time uh, in Ethiopia, and that changed my life. Uh, right, right I, around the regime change. It was just after it, and so wow. my first impressions of Ethiopia, in fact, were to see the Wayene and the tanks and all still on the streets of Addis, mm -hmm. uh, which for me, you know, was a little frightening, but yeah. uh, also very, very exciting. Uh, yeah. Uh, to you know, witness this regime change, as yeah. you put it. Yeah, the um, fall of communism was pretty worldwide, but it, yeah. you know, they're yeah. stunning. They're stunning. I was just looking at a photo this week of like this little boy with a fallen Lenin statue behind him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I might send it to you later. Like, there's stunning image from that time. Oh yeah, well I can remember in Addis Ababa, one of the images there was a, uh, a statue of uh, Marx mm -hmm. uh, over by. Uh, uh the where the hilton hotel is was in the median forget the name of the, the road that goes up past the old african union building there but but anyway somebody had toppled it over and splashed a can of green paint over it yeah you know like that's a vivid image that i yeah. have in my mind from 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 that period but uh yeah, <laughs> exactly exactly so um yeah so to, to make a long story short, I mean, I, I worked on this exhibition, uh, had the uh, wonderful opportunity of uh, being able to travel all around Ethiopia, not only in the north, but also going all the way south to, you know, the Kenyan border mm -hmm. um, and experiencing, you know, the plethora of culture that exists in Ethiopia. Um, and, uh, and after that, uh, um, there was no going back. <laughs> Your short term no, project no, became no, no a going multi decade back to what thing. I was doing before, but there was definitely a going back to Ethiopia. <laughs> mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. yeah your yeah, your yeah. short term project became this multi decade enterprise. Yeah, well, you know, and it, this is life, obviously, mm -hmm. but you know, you never can tell what life has in store for you. And, uh, you know, you're provided with opportunities that you might not have anticipated that can take you in. And all sorts of uh, directions and That's you right. might not and you know and you might not end up you know where you thought you would be uh as a result of that but uh alternatively end up leading a, a very rich life so and i, I should say that i i didn't uh, abandon west africa at all mm -hmm. uh i've kind of led a schizophrenic existence of you know working in both places yeah. uh, which has been interesting because it's uh, uh challenged me in thinking about and contrasting uh, two very different parts of the world yeah i um i think about and I, I was thinking about this earlier um but i i neglected it it's good that you mentioned this now because now you reminded me um Haile Garima, who I believe also may have had crossover with you at uh, UCLA, another friend of my father and family friend or relative of my mother, um, in his most recent movie about World War II, the second, uh, or some people call it a precursor, but the second Italian invasion of Ethiopia, he highlights his father. And I was privy to, uh, privy to a, a small kind of screening, of the very early edit of that film. And I saw this scene that he had where he was talking about his father and his father was on this hill not in priestly garb but kind of in the the gabare or the farmer garb mm -hmm. and he was singing some melody of the church and i was a little shocked because i was like getting into the church at that time for the first time this was several years ago and i knew him as a military soldier patriot uh repeller of the italians fascists mm -hmm but mm. also as one of Ethiopia's, if not Ethiopia's first playwright. And so in talking to Haile Garima, he told me, yes, but first he was a priest. 
So he kind of did what you said. I think kind of ontologically from the church's perspective, you don't ever kind of stop being a priest, but you might retire from the kind of liturgical duties and ministries. And and he did so to become a playwright and a soldier. And mm -hmm. and it reminded me of that the yes, kind of liminalities. Exactly. Yeah. And even mm -hmm. in your own life, the, the openness and willingness to go where life will take you in, in different paths and and to even occupy these different liminalities at, at the same time, like yeah. the willingness to do so. Yeah, I, you know, as a, as a uh, retired professor, uh, primarily the teaching part of being a professor, mm -hmm. uh, I often struggled with students who were very, very bright and motivated, perhaps a little bit too motivated uh, <laughs> to the extent that uh, the uh, metaphor that I use is the blinders that they will put on horses so that mm -hmm. they can only look. And uh, I struggled with these students because I wanted to pull those blinders off. Yeah. Because these students, they were directed towards a very specific goal. And as a result of that, they were not taking advantage of, you know, all these wondrous opportunities that were coming their way. Uh, in term, you know, something as basic as, you know, taking courses that didn't have anything to, you know, directly to do with, with the course that they were on. You yeah. Know, so often these are students that are directed towards, you know, professional careers. You know, they want to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. And uh, and I think it's absolutely critical, you know, to seek out as many new opportunities, uh, have as many experiences one as one can. Uh, when they're young, because the truth of the matter is, is you get older and the responsibilities keep up in terms of, you know, when you get married and you just have a family and such, that you don't have that kind of freedom to yeah. do that. So, um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, my father, when I was young, told me to go to Timbuktu. And so that's why I've lived in Seattle, Los Angeles, Merced, and North Dakota, all DC a little bit before kind of settling but you, down. But you have to go to Timbuktu. Yeah, you that's, have to go. That, believe it or not, you know, I'm, I'm 70 years old here, but yeah. that's, that's on my bucket list. Oh, to, to literally, to literally go to Timbuktu. Yes. Literally. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. it's interesting because I grew up <clears throat> having heard the expression, you mm -hmm. know, you know, you might as well go to Timbuktu. Yeah. You know, and, and again, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for kind of the edge of the world. Yes. Little did I know that it's actually a place, a real place, mm -hmm. and a place with a very, very rich and important history as a center of Islamic scholarship and commerce, yes. you know, in the Sahel region of uh, West Africa with, you know, magnificent architecture and, uh, it's it's a real thing, and yeah. uh, sadly, it's in a part of the world right now that is uh, politically there's a lot of political uh, turmoil there. Uh, but I'm hoping that once things settle down, that I I might make it there before before I join the ancestors. Yeah, I I <laughs> uh, I got it got onto my radar with the rise of Daesh or ISIS in around 2014 when it was super active. There was a Greek Orthodox convert to Islam, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who is the head of a liberal arts college in Berkeley, California, that is an Islamic liberal arts college called Zaytuna. And I heard his sermons because I was seeking what is the traditional Islamic teaching or critique of this kind of militant form that um, purported to be traditional but was actually itself outside of the tradition. And he mentioned having gone to Timbuktu to do some learning. And I think he also went to a madrasa in, in Egypt as well. And mm -hmm. so he did some of his learning in West Africa and in uh, the kind of North of the sub saharan of, of like the Arab Africa as well. So he, he had been to both parts or two, at least two of the different types of parts of learning there too, which reminds me of what you were saying earlier about identity from this idea of uh, young people taking career and academics in this broad way th too. I've over the years evolved the way I kind of perceive identity. And so I had a geneticist, Razib Khan on, and I've been interested in genetics since about 2016 at less, uh, least when I first took a DNA test. And when I was young, I kind of, because of the out of Africa theory that I kind of had loosely uh, or through osmosis absorbed in school, I kind of just assumed, okay, there are absolutely 
uh, you know, no unique things or special things or anything. We're all just Africans who left at different times. And the more DNA is coming out, um, it's interesting that for the most part, that's true, but there are different episodes in Europe and Africa where there were other humans and different types of mixes and all these things. So I got interested in my own personal history and going back to what you said, um, I think in Ethiopia, most people just identify uniquely as Ethiopians or as Habasha. And because of the politics, which I won't make you comment on over the past 30 years, it, it, it began to be reduced to a smaller tribal affiliation that often has to do with language, which, which itself is a, a tricky thing over time as people are flexible with that. And I have people in my family who speak multiple Ethiopian languages. And notably, mm -hmm. my father, my father's father spoke 10. Um, you know, and and my father himself spoke two different Ethiopian languages. His parents spoke about two to three each. Um, on my mom's side, people spoke about two to three, including Sudanic Arabic because they're on the border. Uh, so the language thing for me is not like a primary identity marker. It's more like the Orthodox Christianity and other markers. But um, in in America, you see, and I think the genetics shows that the average Ethiopian is is basically one of the oldest admixtures or mulattoes was kind of like, I, it's it's hard to say white, but if you categorize Arab slash Middle East as white, roughly half white, half black, and each person is individually different. When I did my ancient DNA testing, I ended up finding out very late in life in my 20s and 30s, I happen to be 55%, you know, it, it, Arab is not the right word. It, it's like from the Levant 10 to 20,000 years ago. And then my East African side is about 45%. You know, and what, what do you do with something like that? People in America, I think, in more urban areas, and I grew in the urban fringe, not quite the suburbs, but the urban fringe of Los Angeles, um, would typically want to go with what's perceived as the cooler black culture that comes out of hip hop and everything else in the 90s. And people deeper in the suburbs who are more isolated, and especially the higher they go in education, find themselves in predominantly white institutions. And so, of course, if they're high achievers, they, they want to assimilate to who they perceive around them as, as being the high achievers, especially when the Ethiopian parents are stressing education as much as they do. So I, I think you get different responses about I, identity, but what I have tried to do is to try to mix all of these together, which is of <laughs> course a, a difficult uh, thing to do, but to talk about being Ethiopian and being African-American and not denying this kind of Levantine heritage while also not de denying this African heritage, but trying to have room and place for all of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, everything that you have said uh, kind of really resonates with me in terms of my impressions of Ethiopia. I talked about stepping off the plane the first time in 1991, mm -hmm. and you know it was in my face. Uh, <laughs> and what became really uh, apparent in a very, very short period of time is exactly what we were, you were speaking to, the fact that Ethiopia has for you know, millennia been this amazing crossroads of peoples that have come through Ethiopia. Some have stayed, some have moved on, whatever. Um, and so it is very much kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not at all surprised that, you know, your DNA testing, you know, demonstrated that, you know, your distant ancestors were coming from other parts, you know, of of, of the region, um, and it and the living culture there today speaks to it mm -hmm. because you can see aspects of you know Middle Eastern culture. You know, you mentioned the Levant. You can definitely see that there. You can see uh, 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 South Asian Indian subcontinent. You can see it there. You can see Sub-Saharan Africa there um and it's all sort of converging there and um one of my uh favorite um ethiopian pronunciations of english terms is using when when people use the past tense the way they pronounce the ed at the end of a word mm -hmm. but mix it mix it <laughs> <laughs> You got so, it. Ethiopia is mixed. <laughs> mix it. <laughs> mix it. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that's so funny, um, which is actually kind of a, a perfect um, segue 
to one of the things I, I wanted to um, ask you about. You have this great line in the book. And of course, a lot of it is, uh, some of it's in Addis, but a lot of it is in Aksum, which of course is also the kind of the title of my blog as well, the Aksum Review of Books. So of course, we got along on that level, but you heard this saying that Aksum is a hareg, right? Which is this like vine, and it talks about how intertwined everybody is. And that's why things are are mixing this way. I'm I'm wondering if you could speak to maybe that phrase in particular and any other terms of trade that you that you picked up along the way, whether they're in Amharic, Tigrinya, or Gutiz. Yeah. So, you know, over the last 30 years, I've of course picked up a lot of uh terms, jargon, uh, uh I, I I don't know if I'd refer to them as technical terms, but, mm -hmm. but just terms that are used to talk about the things that you know I've been interested in learning about. Um, and that wonderful expression, um, which in fact is the uh, title of the first chapter of my most recent book. Uh, and we should put the book on screen as well. Oh, Ethiopian Church Art Painters, Patrons, Purveyors by Raymond Silverman and Neil Sabania. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, we um, sort of, rift off this uh, expression that we mm -hmm. have heard many times um, in talking about the relationships between people uh, in in Aksum, but throughout Ethiopia and Addis Ababa, Ababa and uh, not surprisingly in the re my current research, uh, which is working uh, in diaspora communities here in North America, uh, same thing holds true. You know the you know Aksum is is like hareg, so hareg is a term that's used for the uh, dec decorative intertwined designs motifs mm -hmm. that you uh, find painters using uh, in mural paintings in churches that along the edges of the, each of the individual paintings in manuscripts they're used to divide chapters and sections uh, of of the text um, and the distinctive quality about it is that it they're always uh, intervine, intertwined or like you said vine like in nature where you really can't s s things are uh, wound together in such a way that you can't pull them apart that all those lines are somehow seem to be related to one another and so what we came to learn in working um, with uh, this wonderful community of uh, uh, church painters who are also painters uh, who are producing for, for the market uh, today uh, is that they all share history. Mm -hmm. And you start talking about with one person and in a very short period of time, you hear them reference somebody else that you had spoken to. Um, and what you realize, you know, we often um, in the West, we have this expression that it's a small world. Yeah. Which speaks to the same phenomenon. Uh, and it also speaks to that uh, expression that, you, you know, you, you talked about the Gen, Gen Z uh, Ethiopian Americans talking about, you know, the, the two degrees of separation. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that uh, rather than six or is, seven? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, six or seven. That um, you know, it's very, very tightly knit. And uh, if you spend any length of time, kind of familiarizing yourself, and getting to know people uh, in a particular place, you soon come to appreciate that. And uh, we certainly did in the the, uh, the work we did in in Oxford and in Addis. Yeah, and I think you're talking about like people who aren't necessarily even blood related, but it also, the term also refers to your kind of genealogy. And you have a kind of like table of genealogy of <clears throat> the descendants of Halak is at Johannes Taklu, right? And he, yes. he is one of the painters who then it's, it's like a Levitical, uh, a Levitical family of painters mm -hmm. is coming out of him. Yeah, so you have his direct descendants, but then in that, uh, you know, kinship start of genealogy that we present in the book, uh, off to the right-hand side are a whole bunch of painters that weren't, you know, 
blood relations, mm -hmm. at least not direct blood relations. Uh, what we came to realize actually is that uh, everyone is probably re related familiarly as well. Uh, it could be dis uh, a distant relative, but you start mm -hmm. to talk and you get people and it kind of made my head hurt when people started using expressions uh, that reference that someone was a second cousin of my brother's mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's too deep. The well is too deep. Um, yeah. I, I, I realized uh, one of the most shocking statistics you have is like I think it was 1995, if not the early 90s, something like 27,000 people in the city of Aksum, and and with famine and so many issues that could um, befall any community, it reminds me of like the frailty of human life but also mm -hmm. if you have a community that small it makes sense that people are this intertwined right right but even as oxen has expanded you know over the last few decades um you know there's there are a, especially with you know university being there and there are mm -hmm. lots of people coming in from the outside now still if, if you if it doesn't take much getting to know people you know digging in to to begin to uh, get a sense of that hot egg uh, that's that's there. Um, but off to the right-hand side of that uh, genealogy chart are a whole bunch of uh, individuals who are also related to that family mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of having studied, you know, worked in, you know, trained as apprentices in the workshops of some of these painters. Uh, so they're, they're part of that hot egg as well. You know, if you wanted to push that metaphor, you could say that, you know, the direct descendants of uh, Alaka Johannes uh, were the blue line mm -hmm. in, in that hot egg. And then maybe these these other artists who studied directly with, you know, one of, uh, one of the members of uh, uh, Alaka Johannes's family is a blue line, uh, but they're all intertwined. Yeah, and it's, I, I don't know if you and, I, you and I have had so many discussions now, I don't know if we had discussed this, um, but from the Ethiopian Orthodox to Auto Church's interpretation of scripture, the Old Testament and the New, they have these phrases, Israel is a nefs and Israel is a siga, or Israel kind of according to the flesh and Israel according to the soul or even the spirit mm -hmm. is a manifest. And what's interesting about that interpretation is that the church interprets the biological children of Isaac that come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob um, as the church, but in addition to the grafted Gentile communities that came are considered spiritual descendants or spiritual children as well. And so it's very clear that this church priest would also see kind of no difference between biological children and um, children who are like his students of his trade or of his craft. Yeah, 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 but uh, yeah, <clears throat> back to your um, initial question about, you know, terminology yes. uh, that I've become familiar with. Uh, there, of course, are thousands of terms that of I, could, I could cite, but a couple that I wanted to actually talk to you about that I've been very, mm -hmm. very interested in, and, and it's kind of at the heart of the, the research that I do, is the, the terms uh, Bahalawi and Zamanawi. Are you familiar with those? Yes, terms? I'm familiar with okay. both. Yeah. yeah. So the idea of contrasting uh, what is kind of historic, what is tradition seen, seen as traditional, mm -hmm. uh, coming from the past, and those things that are modern and contemporary, yes. and uh, the tension that it that is always there between those two things. So those are two terms that have become that I learned that have been very important in you know, things that I've been thinking about. And I'd love to hear your your take on that. that yeah, so that I'm, I'm an interpreter and translator as well. So my mark is pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my dad would always call me a Ferenc or a foreigner, but I had uh, one time, <laughs> my proudest moment was an interpretation agency hired a third party to test me and they gave me a number five, which was university level Amharic. So I always keep that certificate. It didn't, I already had my own confidence, but I keep that certificate handy. Why am I not? Why am I not surprised? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, and fully born and raised in the diaspora, no less. Yeah. But 
uh, definitely frequented Ethiopia a lot as a kid, and I had Ethiopia. I always joked my my home was kind of a mini unofficial embassy of Ethiopia. But um, Bahadawi, I usually translate as culture or cultural, and there's another word, tufit, that I usually translate mm -hmm. as traditional. But I do think those are synonyms, and so either yeah. translation is fine. Zamanawi is common, and in fact, it's become a guy's name, Zabana, where the, the oh. M shifts into consonantally a B. And so you, mm -hmm. you see that in some words, like the word for rain, Zinam, is sometimes Zinab. It's a common consonantal shift from, um, from M to B. Um, and, and that is pretty standardly translated as modern. And what's interesting now that you brought up these terms is now I see a greater connection between art and medicine. And that's because the same dynamic or dichotomy you just presented in the art world is presented in the medicine world. So you have the deptera or the cantors who are trained in kind of, uh, let's say, traditional pharmaceuticals using herbs and stuff like that, that seeps into even like my grandmother's recipes of atmit, which is like a combination of like tea, raw honey, onions and garlic to get people uh, better from their sicknesses. Um, and, and, and sometimes these adeptera might uh, kind of go away from the church and, and delve into magic and sorcery with this stuff. But sometimes it's just neutral herbal medicine, and that's called bahalawi uh, or, or cultural or traditional. And then the zamanawi is seen as like the kind of Western science or, or Western medicine. And in fact, your, uh, my father and also my mother but my father twice, uh, by the way, double dipped at UCLA, his grad school too. And then you were at UCLA. Um, when I was in grad school, I picked up a medical doctor one time of East Asian descent. And she was proud to incorporate her mother's use of turmeric, which is an example of this type of mm -hmm. Bahanawi medicine, mm -hmm. at the East Meets West Center, which is a center at UCLA, where they incorporate a lot of uh, Chinese um, yeah. medicine with western medicine as well and so the ethiopian context has that dichotomy in art and in um and in the world of medicine yeah yeah interesting yeah, yeah. so anyway i i i'm interested in it from sort of the the art or visual expression mm -hmm. uh, because there there is a real tension there's a debate that's that goes on uh <clears throat> about uh whether or not Ethiopia is losing something in embracing the Zamanawi practices, mm -hmm. uh, which tend to uh, things that are associated with sort of global artistic expression, yes. um, you know, contemporary art, for instance, which in looking at it, um, you know, some of it you can you can see the ethiopian roots or connections but some of it it's, it's not there at all and so there's some people that sort of bemoan the fact that you know this is taking us in the wrong direction and, and that we really need to embrace uh the halawi personally i think the tension that exists between the two is absolutely vital and that's where we need to be uh, because out of that tension comes some pretty wonderful kind of creative thinking and making. Yeah, I I think you did a great game when you would show the different cards, and I think you you showed this uh, to me in your uh, to me research, uh, where you look at different cards or prints, and you push churches to think about. Is it the same thing to use a modern or Zemanawi printer of an image that has the style of Bahadawi or cultural or traditional? And then also conceiving of what about, you know, art schools that totally just mix the styles itself and where you pushed me the most in my thinking, actually, that I hadn't even thought of is whether the scribes, which is the written form of art that I know the most, uh, should use the kumsuhuf or the traditional uh, scribal writing to recreate gospels and stuff for liturgical use. And I don't have that, and I didn't have a chance to show you in person, but I could show you this is from uh, my father's grandfather. His mother um, actually um, 
gave it to me upon her death in 2019. And so this is a few hundred year old uh, Psalm of David. Mm -hmm. And no, it's, it's upside down, down but okay. sorry. Yeah, that's no, good. Okay. And it has, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> funny enough, in the in the opening, if you if you look at it, it it has curses for anyone who steals the book. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know if my great grandfather stole it or if, if potentially one of his ancestors had stolen it from him. But the story my grandmother told me as she was reading this for me back in 2011, I had first taught myself how to read and write. So I would read Amharic newspapers with her and. Um, she was one of the only people really helping me that my parents told me go learn on my own. But when I visited my grandmother, who this was hers, she would read from the Psalms of David for me in Giz and interpret it for me in Amharic. And she was a highly literate woman that never really went beyond high school. And uh, mm -hmm. she would show me Amharic newspapers and this manuscript, uh, Psalms of David. But you mm -hmm. you pushed me to think about it. And I raised the question actually to um, you know the bishop and some of the priests that said, what if we got a handwritten set of liturgical books? Um, you know, how much would it cost to commission it and, and all that? But is there a worthwhile difference between that kind of um, the labor of love that goes into that art and the same thing, like you said, of mm -hmm. making an icon or a painting versus doing a kind of a print of it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And you, you, of course, have hit upon, you know, one of the things I'm most interested in, in ex exploring. And I, and again, it, it, the heart of it is this tension between the Halawa and Zemanawi. Uh, so, you know, the, the way I, I think I framed the question is, that, you know, the, the Burana manuscripts. Is a Burana manuscript better than one that's been mechanically printed on paper. And in my, you know, in my own field of inquiry, uh, which is art, you know, visu visual expression, is a painting of uh, Mary and her beloved son uh, on paper as good, better, worse than one that's been painted uh, by an Ethiopian artist, Ethiopian painter. Um, and uh, you know, and and you know, what I'm hearing is that there is a qualitative difference, and that people uh, would prefer the barana and the hand painted over things that are mechanically reproduced. But that in in fact, the function of the two is identical. Both of them, it, it's not so much the object itself, it's what it represents, what it conveys, the message. So in the case of, you know, uh, uh, Psalms of David, it really doesn't matter. It's, you know, the words of David that are most important. And whether it's printed on a printing press or, um, you know, a scribe as laboriously and beautifully written it on the pages of parchment it really doesn't matter so so i'd be curious you said that you asked the bishop and some other yeah. people about what was their response i think they are very used to the abinet schools the traditional schools where there's an interesting strange tension between it's necessary as a witness and as a kind of last resort to have things written and to keep them. And they love that culture. However, in most of the history, there wasn't such universal access to these texts through printing. Mm -hmm. In fact, even throughout most of the 20th century, you had kind of Italian planted printing presses in Asmara that mm -hmm. were providing a lot of printed books. It wasn't until just about three to four years ago where the Ethiopian Synod had come out with a commercial release of the Bible. Up mm -hmm. until that point, it was fragmented all over mm -hmm. the place in the mm -hmm. traditional schools, but it mm -hmm. wasn't like widely available to the laity. Um, it was kind of shrouded in secrecy in that way. And yeah. so that the majority of people's options and opportunities to interact with the text is to hear it read aloud during the liturgy. And and the the scholars have this high culture where 
it's seen as a weakness to rely and look at the text and actually the ultimate goal is memorization of the text and to be able to recite it from memory and so whether you have a kind of printed one or a hand written one if the ultimate goal is memorization and, and reciting it from memory as as if it was oral tradition but that's where the weird tension is is it it's not like fully oral there is usually always at least one text as kind of a witness but then they want to um sometimes it's couched in language of like grain ahmed right uh, this mm -hmm. uh, 16th century imam who came and destroyed a lot of the churches like what if uh, some destroyer came we would have to recreate the books and so there's also this like desire to to have the capacity to make the book again from scratch if need be but to not rely on it for day to day so i i think they're not kind of persuaded by it but maybe if there was uh, and this gets to some of your book in the title uh if there was i think one kind of patron or in this age you know patronage is democratized online through mm -hmm. patreon and, and other mm -hmm. sources um that i've benefited from and others have as well kickstarter campaigns things like that it, if if i think the right patron came across i don't think they would shun it but i think otherwise it wouldn't be a high priority for them mm -hmm. interesting yeah yeah so i've got <clears throat> smiled at one juncture what, what you were saying um uh, about the relationship between text and orality mm -hmm. <clears throat> and such and you use um uh or the reference to the fact that if someone like uh Ahmed Yurain came through and destroyed the manuscripts how could they be kind of reconstructed unless you know they were uh people had memorized them mm -hmm. so couldn't help me but think that you know these days in terms of thinking about technology you know people are worried about okay what what happens if your hard drive <laughs> you have to put it in the cloud yes so what you're doing the safest way to preserve you know what it is you have on your computer is to put it in the cloud which is exactly what you're talking about in terms of text and orality yeah but, yeah and uh, and i'm interested because we're discussing this in a frame um of bahalawi and zamanawi of kind of traditional stuff and modern stuff and I think you told me a lot of people you know, kind of in the field, focused on what is the kind of most, what has the most ancient or longest provenance, uh, provenance in terms of the artwork. Like, what are the oldest pieces? Mm -hmm. And and your even I feel like your focus is almost a mix of these because it's not necessarily that you're interested in the modern uh, styles. You you do prefer the traditional but you're interested in kind of the personalities and people in contemporary times rather at like re-manifesting uh, re this traditional artwork as opposed to just which like individual pieces are the oldest. And I'm, I'm wondering how, how you kind of found that, that niche. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you for asking that question because it's, it's a big part of my identity of who, who I am and what it is I've, done uh, in, in terms of my career and life um, in that I've always been interested in people more so than than objects. I mean, what drew me to the feet, the field was were objects that I found to be beautiful and compelling uh, things. But what I very quickly became most interested in is the people that make and use those things. And so if you look at the title of, you know, the book that you held up, it's not Ethiopian church art, paintings, patronage, and shops. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's about people. It's painters, patrons, and purveyors. And so the book is basically uh, it, it draws upon a lot of biography of a lot of individuals who become part of this, you know, meta narrative about, you know, the role of religious art in modern and contemporary Ethiopia. Um, and so it's 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 the people 
uh, that are most impart important. They're the ones, um, you know, I, again, you can go back to what you were saying before, of, you know, about the relationships between text and orality. The objects themselves can be seen as the text, whereas the actual practice process of using those objects is the or oral part of it. It's, you know, um, what that process um, and orality, they're time time based. All right. They, they aren't fixed in time. Um, they're, uh, they exist in the moment that they are happening. Whereas the objects, though, can in fact be suspended in time. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it does. And this emphasis on, on people that you have is, is present too, because it's not just your name on here. Um, I've, I've been interested for several years, ever since I heard an economist talking about the idea of co-authorship and mm -hmm. you have another author here, Neil Sabania, um, whom I don't know much about it, to be frank. I, I would love to hear how you got to working together as opposed to this being just a, a kind of one man show or operation and, and what, what your thoughts are on co-authorship. Yeah. <clears throat> so co-authorship or in the context, I also work in museums, co-curation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, again, because it's, it's people focused, I've always enjoyed collaborating with people, working with people. I uh, sincerely believe that the product of many minds is better than the product of a single mind. Uh, we in the West tend to celebrate individual genius. I celebrate collaborative genius. Uh, and uh, and not only do I think that the, the product of you know working with other people uh, ends up being better than what a, a single individual can do, um, it's that the process itself is fulfilling to whoever it is that's engaged in it. It's a much rich, richer experience when you're able to engage in dialogue with with your co-author or co-curator, what have you. Um, so I met Neil, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but he, he lives in Tacoma. So he's close by. I so didn't he, know that. He, I didn't know that. No, no, no. I'll, I'll send you his contact information. But yeah, anyway, he's, he's a ter terrific guy. He's trained uh, as a historian. Um, his first encounter, and I think- Like Harold. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, he uh, studied um, uh, undergraduate in Western Michigan at Hope College. He then went to Ohio University and then did his PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Um, but he, his introduction to Ethiopia was uh, in the Peace Corps in the late 1960s and um, early 70s that he was there. And um, he fully intended to do his history uh, dissertation research in Ethiopia, but the 1974 revolution occurred and that was not a possibility for him. So, so he ended up working in Northern Kenya, uh, but has been very involved in Ethiopia. He's an avid collector. So he has, from the time he was in Ethiopia during the Peace Corps, he's collected things, uh, a lot of, uh, contemporary uh, material culture um, and amassed a, a really marvelous collection. So in the early 90s, when I was working on this exhibition that we referred to a while back in our conversation, um, Harold Marcus said, you know, there's this guy over in um, Holland, Michigan, over on the west side of the state. I was in central Michigan at Michigan State University. Uh, this this guy uh, Neil Sabania, who has a wonderful collection of Ethiopian artifacts, which you might want to look at. So Carol and I uh, went over uh, to meet uh, Neil and to look at the, some of the things that he collected, and uh, we almost immediately uh, became friends. Uh, and we ended up um, from 
I guess our first time in Ethiopia together was maybe in 1997. Uh, but from 1997 on, um, most of our work in Ethiopia we've uh, done together. Uh, the writing that we've done as a result of the research, um, you know, we've co-authored, uh, depending on what we were working on, either one or the other of us uh, was the lead author, kind of took the first stab at writing a manuscript. But yeah, but it's been a very rich collaboration. And, um, and I also regard our book as a collaboration with, you know, the 200 plus people that we interacted with, the painters, the patrons, and the purveyors uh, that we talk about in the book, uh, who I, I sincerely see uh, as co-authors of what it is, you know, we were doing. And that's one of the reasons, it, it's interesting, um, I, you know, when you publish a book, you know, the publisher, you submit a manuscript and the publisher sends it out to for review. Mm -hmm. And some of the feedback we got back from people was, you know, they, they liked the manuscript and all, but they said that, you know, there are too many names of too many people. <laughs> I, see, yeah, I saw that comment you had in the book. Yeah, too many names of too many people. And the, the fact is, is that most of the people reading this book those names won't be, mean anything to them. And both Neil and I felt very strongly that uh, there was no way we were going to change that because so much of what has been written about Africa and Africans, and more specifically, Ethiopia and Ethiopians, uh, the makers and users of objects, the people who own these objects and who own the practices uh, that utilize these objects are are nameless. They're anonymous, and the fact is, is they see people have names. So I don't know. In going into museums, you no doubt see the stark contrast between going into parts of the museum where they're talking about Western art, and you have the names of all these artists, and then you go over into the part of the museum that's dealing with Africa. And what you what do you have? They maybe give you the, the name of an ethnic group. And the fact is, is all of those things were made by individuals. And they were owned by individuals. But because of the biases of how those things were collected, um, you know, those the, that that goes missing. So so anyway, we uh that that notion of collaboration is, is kind of uh uh, permeates uh, everything that I do. Um, yeah, I, I I noticed that, and I think it's very powerful the way that you have those names there. There is this biblical interpretation that the kind of presence of people are there uh, with their name, and that begins with the the presence of God is Him in His name, and people as bearers of His image, as kind of the icons or the paintings of God that God painted. And so it's yeah, it's beautiful to have, I think, all those names. And I'm glad that you stuck to your guns, both of you, in that regard. Yeah. Um, I read there that the only compromise you made is just not having all the titles, which gave me a bit of a chuckle because some of them are very repetitive in terms of the titles, like Halaka or, you know, Chief oh. Boss. And it, it's funny because as a, a, I'm a deacon in my 30s, there are some deacons who are eight or 10 years old. And so one of the kind of unique practices of the Ethiopian Orthodox, as opposed to our sister churches in Egypt, Syria, Armenia, and even our distant cousins in Greece and Russia, is that uh, in those places, usually deacon is res reserved for an adult man. And, but because of the prevalence of so many, uh, you know, teenagers and sometimes younger in Ethiopia, the way that deacons differentiate themselves if they don't move on to the priesthood and become a father, or sometimes even if they do, is they'll get these other titles that signify their learning in other ecclesiastical er areas, whether it is uh, iconography, whether it is scripture interpretation, poetry, or the various types of liturgies that are available as well. And so they'll have these titles to differentiate themselves. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think we, 
chatted about this. Uh, my, my confession is that I've just been totally overwhelmed by the abundance of church titles. I, I, it seems like, you know, I, there might be a moment where I say, you know, I think I've heard them all. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes up with another, you know, lick it all, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah. So anyway, always learning. I wanted to mention one thing that um, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of the flip side of uh, this, uh, for me, this, this passion or the necessity of identifying people is that there are practices which actually eschew that in terms mm -hmm. of, yes. and especially within the context of the Orthodox Church, which I am um, very much aware of and greatly admire. So if you look at historical paintings, you very, very seldom ever see the name of, of the painter. Mm -hmm. they, they don't sign their work. Um, and you will on occasion more regularly see the name of the patron yes there because the actual act of commissioning that work and donating it to the church is an act of salvation so there, there's a, a, a reason for that but in terms of the, the maker it is a gesture of humility yeah <clears throat> for the artist not to mention themselves not to be seen as a creator of anything because there is only one creator and <clears throat> so back to Halakha Johannes Teklu, um, you know, he uh, on occasion would, would indicate, you know, often the formula that's used is just the painter and then the individual's name following it. But he uh, on occasion would, would identify himself as the painter, but also uh, refer to himself as as your servant and mm -hmm. and then the sinner yes Halakha yeah very Yohannes common Teklu. i was gonna say that very common yeah yeah gabrik gabrika the mm -hmm. your your servant slash slave or bond servant the yes. sinner yes, yes. yes. it's a very very common another friend of mine that you know in our intertwined hadek uh professor mahari uh over mm -hmm. now at, at uw yeah. A frequenter of this podcast, uh, him and I transcribed this manuscript of a type of liturgy of the hours slash psalter, and the scribe exactly that in in the manuscript that we found exactly what you said. He he did that. Your your servant, the sinner, and yeah. even in the United States history, which I sometimes teach at the high school level, it's fascinating to look at for example, what was popularized in the, the musical Hamilton, but which uh, we have manuscript documents of in United States history, this banter between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, which culminated in the duel in which Hamilton mm -hmm. died. Even as Hamilton is insulting Burr in these letters, even in the Anglo tradition, at the end, he signs off your servant. And you think he says something like your humble servant or your yeah. modest yeah, servant, yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, another ex expression of Zamanawi is that today there are many painters who not only prominently, you know, post their, their name, name yeah. but they also post their telephone number. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with that great zero nine one one area code. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But we, which yeah, it's. <laughs> I, I may, maybe their Viber, WhatsApp, Telegram group as well. <laughs> That'll be the next development. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, exactly. that, this has been an amazing conversation, Raymond. Thank you so much. Um, I would love for you to uh, have any final words you have to say about Aksum or Ethiopia or anything else. And then uh, let my audience know if, if there's anything available online or in person where they can check out your stuff or any awesome museums that they should visit, whether in the United States or elsewhere that you've been. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll mention a, a couple of uh, uh, museums, um, one in particular, um, but then I, I wanted to kind of finish up with a final question for you. That, Excellent. Uh, 
actually re relates to uh, my current research. Uh, well, I, I might mention since we haven't spoken about it, just to sh share uh, with your listeners um, uh, what I'm currently working on, but something that emanated from uh, my work in uh, uh, Ethiopia is that in my visiting a, a few Orthodox churches in the Washington DC area back in, I think it was 2013, I encountered uh, paintings by some of the same painters that were producing work in Ethiopia that I had mm -hmm. worked with. And I became fascinated with, with that connection uh, in terms of people, you know, folks in the diaspora going back home to, to look for, for painters who could produce uh, uh, the, the paintings. And that led to, um, you know, in, in visiting these churches, uh, with the exception of one church in uh, uh, Medhani, Medhani Alam in uh, Temple Hill, Maryland. All of the churches were in buildings that had been uh, created for some other purpose, uh, many of them secular. So a couple of them are in warehouses. One is in, um, one was in a uh, old uh, utility uh, garage for, you know, AT&T. Uh, uh, telecom company. Uh, some of them were in old stores. Uh, many of them are in churches that were built for other denominations and all, but had been converted into uh, or Ethiopian Orthodox churches. And I became fascinated in the process of, of that kind of conversion. What does it take to convert a building that was made for another purpose into a sacred space for uh, Ethiopian Orthodox uh, worship, and um, and I was specifically interested in the role that paintings played in that context. And so now, and this is the context in which you and I met, mm -hmm. um, my coming to Seattle um, as part of that uh, uh, research to visit some of the churches there, uh, which are, in which all of these things uh, take place. But the the one museum uh, in the U.S. that has uh, by far the uh, richest collection of historic Ethiopian uh, Ethiopian Orthodox art uh, is the Walters Museum of Art in Baltimore. And this is the museum that just organized an exhibition that sadly is closing uh, uh, next week uh, called Ethiopia at the Crossroads that in fact focuses on what we spoke about early earlier in our conversation uh, that Ethiopia is very much a crossroads of many cultural traditions uh, coming from all over the world. Um, but they have a very rich uh, collection. Um, and uh, a good uh, amount of it uh, on display. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is there are very, very few other museums that, that have Ethiopian collections. Mm -hmm. Michigan State University has a, a big collection now, uh, for better or for worse, thanks to me, uh, because of this exhibition that we did in 1994, where we did a lot of collecting of contemporary uh, craft uh, uh, traditions and some paintings. Um, but, uh, but there's not a lot um, uh, to look at, but um, yeah. But, but I did want to ask you one, one final question. So you are a second generation Ethio American, correct? Depending on how you count, but yes. Uh, okay. Depending on yeah. if you count born here, I'm first. Right. But if you but you talk about both of my parents have been here for over fifty years, and yes. so in, in yeah. that sense, second generation, right? Yeah. So you're but you're a born you're uh, American born. Yes. Of Ethiopian descent. Mm -hmm. So I've been really interested. You know, I'm of course aware of kind of the general immigrant experience in the U.S. and sort of a, uh, a pattern that has been followed in terms of how people coming from all parts of the world have uh, become part of this, what used to be referred to as a melting pot. Yes. Now I think the metaphor is that it's a salad bowl. Yeah. Uh, Two competing views, yeah. Yeah. So, as as an American-born uh, man of 
Ethiopian descent. How do you perceive the relationship that American born uh, Ethio Americans have of Ethiopia? What is, and what is their connection to Ethiopia? What does it mean to them? Yeah, I, I think I am maybe if not a full generation, slightly less than a full generation after the first kids. The oldest Ethiopian Americans I know are in their mid to late 40s. Mm. And I'm in my mid 30s. And I would say I think it was internet and isolation. But when I look at those in their 40s, I think I know one or two of them for example, that have retained the Amharic language uh, to some degree, far less than me, but to some degree. And the rest of them seem to have just fully assimilated into American society. And so I think they have a kind of vague interest in maybe visiting once or twice in their life Ethiopia, but other than that, they're fully assimilated. They're fully in that melting pot generation. What I see of the Gen Z and Gen Alpha younger than me, especially, is I think through the internet, like I think there's no greater increase of globalization uh, than the internet. And, and counterintuitively what that's done is it's made that, that longing that the diaspora kids have for the homeland be facilitated. And so I see actually like, People in teenage years and in their 20s right now have almost an identical replica, for example, of the liturgical tradition. They're becoming kind of liturgical scholars through YouTube. Now, some of them also have personal connections to homeland teachers who have moved to the diaspora. But I, I know several who the brunt of their learning, the overwhelming amount of their learning is coming from resources that have been put online in audio only, but also in, in video form and are mm. kind of all autodidacts or self-taught through the medium of the internet. And so I, I see them as more of that salad bowl kind of striving to be fully American while also being fully Ethiopian. But, but a lot maintaining of that identity, yeah while maintaining yeah. it which i personally had done without having as much internet you know having grown up on dial up and and before you know i uh, as as young as i may be compared to you to people who are watching in the audience there are a lot of young viewers on youtube i was telling this to some of my i have a chess club at my high school that i that i lead i was telling them some of them asked me when did i start chess i started chess with my windows 95 you know <laughs> so <laughs> i had chess and jazz ball if people know the game jazz ball and i had word yeah. processing before there was internet i didn't yeah. get internet until the aughts the early yeah. aughts and even then it was slow it was dial up you couldn't be on the phone the phone line at the same time as the internet so like versus the generation that grew up fully online in high speed internet they have access to this content that i never had access to and so i was an anomaly in my generation but the kind of mid millennials and elder millennials and and higher maybe even some gen x in there at the oldest and and that like my generation pretty much just assimilates as i said earlier either they want to fully assimilate to black american culture or they want to assimilate fully to um white american culture especially the kind of um the northeast uh, wasp culture and and that dominance because they see it as the thing to strive for and but the younger ones, especially the younger ones, I think are, are doing an incredible job of, of not having the melting pot, but having that, that yeah. salad bowl, that yeah. inter integration rather than assimilation. Yeah. Yeah. Cause in, you know, vis visiting uh, Orthodox churches here in North America, I, I kind of been bowled over by, uh, you know, an expression of what you just said, that the number of young deacons mm -hmm. in the church, like, I mean, it's a, it's amazing, and that the fact that these kids are dedicating the time and effort to learn giz, yeah. and and to you know acquire the liturgical knowledge, um, uh, and to see, you know, I, I saw this in Toronto and so in Canada as well as here in the U.S. Uh, deacons who were born here in North America stand up and give you know, biblical interpretations as part of 
as, as part of the service on a Sunday and be, yeah. you, know, you know, 16, 17 years old um, and terribly articulate, thoughtful in what they do, uh, like, no, well, like you. It, it will. And, and I'm thinking in my head, because I've met over hundred, like hundreds of deacons, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And I know pretty much everyone in the United States. We all kind of know each other. It's a small yeah. world, as you said. Yeah. Um, in my head, there's one person I know of who was born here, and I don't even think he's actively serving anymore. Everyone else, they came at five, seven as a baby or mm -hmm. like 10. And then they're all the young teenagers and people yeah. in their 20s. There's no one my age. Uh, it's really phenomenal. At my age, they're they're just not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the young yeah. ones, the, the yeah. teenagers in the twenties, yeah. they they are strong and their yeah. batch is strong. And I yeah. I hope they keep up their secular education and professional lives as well because yeah. they've certainly retained that. And some of them are really good at that, but some of them I think are struggling with balancing the two. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a yeah. it's a tricky balance, but it's it's yeah. definitely doable, and there are plenty of examples. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to flatter you in any way, but uh, you, you're truly exceptional in that regard uh, in terms of you kind of pushing against your parents' attitude. Yeah. <laughs> your, your parents' attitude was very much, you know, a, a first generation or immigrant mindset that what they want for their kids is they want their kids to be successful. Yes. And part of being successful in this country is assimilating. And so, you know, you mentioned earlier, you're, you know, your folks saying, you know, if you want to learn on heart, you know, I wish you luck. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I have to give them credit. They taught yeah. me the spoken language, but in terms yeah. of the reading and writing, they said, really digging in and getting it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they yeah, said, yeah. we don't have the time or energy to do so. When you yeah. were a child, you didn't want it as an adult. Yeah. You should, you know, go, yeah. go do it yourself in terms right. of that, because it, it's not going to get you a, you know a job and yeah the, <laughs> my, my rebellion was to to integrate and i actually have been paid for interpretation jobs <laughs> by the there city of go. los angeles yeah. by hospitals and other facilities because of that yeah. and so i said hey look the amharic had a purpose it, it certainly did so anyway this has been delightful i really enjoyed the conversation thank you so much great